I'd like to entertain you for the next 15 minutes or so uh, on the uh, technology mechanism <coughs> of the UNFCCC and the question what can it do for energy and development, as that's the, the theme of this conference. But I'll spend most time on this technology mechanism itself and why it, it, it came to be and why I, I think, I really believe that it is an opportunity um, to do more with technology transfer uh, in the climate change regime, but it's also very important for the climate change regime uh, itself. Um, so I'll take a step back with you and look at the answers to the question why there is a technology mechanism in the first place, uh, what it is and what is the current state of play, because it's very much under development at the moment. It might be good to update you on that. And lastly, maybe reflect a little bit on what the technology mechanism can do for the uh, sustainable and for all um, goals. You, I think it's right to ask the question why there is a technology mechanism, because in energy technology there is already a lot going on. Uh, there are many international organizations uh, doing work on it. IRENA is the most recent uh, addition, but it was already a rather long list uh, before that. Multilateral development banks, uh, bilateral programs, especially Germany, but also UK, in the Netherlands, they all focus on this energy technology uh, question. They transfer technology in a way they make sure enabling environments in countries are formed. So a lot of it is happening already. So why would you look from the UNFCCC perspective, the climate negotiations perspective, at, at technology? And I think for that you can actually take a step back and really look at the climate problem itself. Um, the countries that actually cause the problem, and it's illustrated by this graph of uh, energy consumption uh, globally, are not the countries that suffer the consequences of climate change. So the causes are in some countries, industrialized countries with high emissions, uh, high technology countries, if you will, whereas the greatest vulnerability is, generally speaking, in, in poorer countries. If you would agree on a climate change agreement that focuses on emission reductions, what you're actually doing is, is going against the interests of, of countries. Because in developed countries, in industrialized countries, the costs of re reducing emissions are rather high. But the benefits of those emission reductions go to other countries, the most vulnerable countries. So high costs and relatively low benefits for those countries. So on that, if you focus solely on emission reductions, you can conclude it's not in the interest of the countries that should most urgently act on climate change to reduce their emissions necessarily. There's of course a moral imperative, but the costs are so high that at some point, you know, um, uh, the question is whether the moral imperative is, is strong enough. So the emission reduction agreement, like the Kyoto Protocol, is actually not in the interest of those that should most urgently reduce emissions. Now, assuming as well that countries act as rational actors that are self-interested in the climate negotiations, I think there's a lot of uh, evidence for that. And at the same time, there are very little means of enforcement of an international agreement. The Kyoto Protocol is uh, called a, legal, a legally binding agreement, but in reality, there are no mechanisms to coerce countries into, uh, into complying with it. You can conclude that an emission reduction agreement is not going to work because eventually it's not in the interest of the countries that have to reduce their emissions to actually comply with the Kyoto Protocol or a follow-up agreement on emission reductions. What we really need is an agreement that is more self-reinforcing, that countries that should act will want to ratify and want to adhere to. In other words, we need reciprocity in a climate regime. Countries should perceive uh, benefits out of, that, uh, out of the agreement. And that's, in, in, my, um, in my opinion, where the technology mechanism and where technology as a topic uh, comes in the picture. Because for uh, the high emitting countries, which are also generally the technology leaders in the world, the technology exporters, where the highest concentration of technological capabilities are, um, those countries are also the ones that should produce emissions. And a technology like, for instance, wind energy is not just you know, the wind turbine, there's a lot of manufacturing around it, knowledge and, and skills. You need to regulate it, you need to transport the, the turbine, you need a lot of raw material in there. And all of that leads to jobs and economic uh, benefits. And we're talking about developed countries, here, right? China as well, increasingly. 
Um, so if you would agree on technologies, on low carbon technologies, instead of on emission reductions, you might see a change in your interest structure of your climate change agreement, and, and therefore it might be a more uh, viable uh, agreement. So for me, personally, that's, you know, taking a very long step back, that's a, a part of the reason why technology mechanism is, uh, is actually important. Um, what it can also do, um, another very big reason why it's important, is that there is, as Alice already said, uh, the capability problem in developing countries. There's a very big need for technology transfer, meaning hardware, but especially software and, and capability. So it could also, the technology mechanism could also address climate change by you know, building capacity and transferring technologies to developing countries. And that has to be done across the entire innovation system. It's not just about deployment of technology, it's not just about hardware. Uh, but it should be about everything. It should, it should even be about the R&D phase, a phase that is often um, forgotten for developing countries. But we need R&D capabilities as well to adapt technologies to local conditions and to build up a long-term innovation system. And that's not an easy feat. This is just one representation of uh, this innovation system um, outlining for the R&D phase um, who are the actors and what are roughly their functions. And you see that you need private sector, you need government, and, and you need research, especially. For a demonstration phase, going a bit further, um, you probably also need the financial sector involved, and users and consumers who need to eventually adopt the technology. And the diffusion phase, research, the research section is, is maybe less important, but the others still are important. So this innovation system, if you want rollout of energy development, low carbon development technologies globally, something like this, and that's different for every country, needs to be in place um, everywhere. Otherwise, things just won't start, start growing. So, international agreements based on emission reductions will continue to fill. We need an innovation system in developing countries for capability building and technology transfer. And it can, a technology mechanism could begin to provide some reciprocity to technology leading countries by providing first mover advantages, um, innovation benefits, and reducing market efficiencies in that. And also, possibly in the climate negotiations, the psych psychological effect, if you will, of not capping your future, but actually, technology sounds more like opportunity, like progress. So, that's a reason why um, it is maybe a good thing to look at this technology mechanism. So I'll go into what it is at the moment uh, now, and get a bit more, more practical. Um, technology in the negotiations in the UNFC has a long history. It started uh, uh, in Article 4.3, 5, and, and 7 in the UNFC. It's already mentioned that uh, Annex 1 countries should transfer technology to uh, non-Annex 1 countries. It was operationalized as well. Uh, to some degree, if you want, the, um, there was an expert group on technology transfer formed. It was um, uh, abandoned uh, a few years ago when the technology mechanism got into force. And technology needs assessments were done in various countries, but the implementation of that was not uh, particularly good. There's also a website, uh, kind of a technology brokerage website. Uh, operation, operational, the TT Clear website where you can find information about different technologies. The idea is to share information and to make it publicly available. And also uh, capacity building activities uh, were taking place on a limited scale uh, initiated by the UNFC. But in this kind of pre-Bali period, the Bali conference of uh, COP13 in 2007, um, there was a lot of talk on technology transfer but not so much action. Um, that change in, in, in Bali, when uh, in the run-up to the Copenhagen uh, negotiations, uh, it was decided that technology was going to be a separate uh, track. And mind you, earlier the discussions were mainly about the Kyoto Protocol and about how to make these emission reductions happen, how to implement the CDM, um, but there was no focus policy otherwise on technology transfer, and that changed in, in Bali. Um, it resulted actually in Copenhagen, in the establishment of the technology mechanism, but in the climate negotiations we're not allowed to talk about Copenhagen anymore. So it was officially established at COP16 in, uh, in 2010 in Cancun. And the technology mechanism has SP2 elements, the technology executive committee, 
and the Climate Technology Center and Network, the CTC and then and I'll go into that a little bit uh, later. Um, and it's aimed to be fully operational by the end of this year. So um, there's a lot going on at this moment. The Tech the Technology Executive Committee is supposed to be kind of the policy arm of the technology mechanism. It's kind of a reincarnation of this uh, expert group on technology transfer that existed earlier. Um, but the expert group was very politicized, and the tech is supposed to be that a little bit less. Um, the members are supposed to be experts, so they're not necessarily negotiators, and that makes a, a big difference in the discussions you're having. But there's a balanced representation of a number of people from uh, developed countries, from developing countries, from the least developed countries, and small island uh, developing states. Um, the Cancun agreements uh, show a number of functions that the tech should do, uh, provide overviews of technology that needs, uh, assess policy and technical issues, share information, uh, facilitate and catalyze action on technology, whatever that means, uh, and find ways to engage stakeholders to build the momentum of the technology mechanism. So that's kind of their mandate and their assignments of these 20 people who meet every few months uh, and, and discuss <coughs> these issues. Uh, I think um, Bush can maybe also testify to that is what what really happens in the room when the, the tech is meeting. Um, they take in some information. There are some members that are really experts and really want to make this happen, this technology mechanism, really want to bring the, the, the work forward. But there are also still some negotiators in the room and they approach the tech as a negotiation issue. And uh, the consequence of that is that everything, for instance, the US, everything that smells like doing anything concretely, uh, they generally tend to uh, hold it back. So it's not quite working yet, I think. What's maybe more interesting, because it's really new, is this Climate Technology Center and uh, Network, CTCNN. It has uh, various roles uh, listed uh, here. I won't go into them. Uh, very deeply, but I'd like to indicate that they do indicate very much clearly that it should build capacity, uh, enhance capabilities, work all over the technology cycle, so not just deployment, but also R&D, and also helping to facilitate financing of, uh, of activities. Now, CTCNN is not operational yet. There was a tender um, for proposals for it. Um, a decision on uh, who will finally get the CTC and will be made in Doha, but it looks like um, it will be a consortium led by UNEP. And actually, um, EC and the institution is part of this consortium as well. But it's a very global group of institutions uh, from all different uh, continents with expertise in both mitigation and, and adaptation. Now, how will it work? It's very demand driven. Um, so the CDC doesn't do anything unless a developing country files a request and then they deal with the request. They either try to, and the request could be assistance on a technology uh, or an energy access program or a renewable energy plan or an agricultural adaptation uh, plan. It could be everything related to that. So the, um, the country makes a submission, uh, the CTC drafts a response plan and either through the network, which is a bigger group than these institutions here, this question will be answered, or by the CTC itself, if it's a, a smaller uh, question. The idea is also that uh, there will be a very extensive reporting and evaluation um, um, procedure so that everybody can learn from what's happening uh, in, this, uh, in this field. And it will be actually very interesting to see what kind of requests will come to the CTC. What's what will countries ask? Uh, and, um, yeah, so that will be interesting to see. So um, maybe just concluding, um, I think in the language of the, the technology mechanism, it uses all the right words. It's, a lot of it is, is in there. The tech is meeting regularly. It's kind of operational, but it's all rather deadlocked still. Um, the funding situation is very unclear. Uh, at the moment, the CDC is supposed to have funding, but the tech doesn't really have a lot. Uh, possibly there could be a, te a technology window in the Green Climate Fund, but that's uh, unclear, and the tech cannot agree on whether they want to request something on that. Um, 
Um, much depends on what the CTC can do, because that's really an operational uh, uh, arm. And in my opinion, the technology mechanism actually could go a bit further than it's currently doing. It, it could maybe do more uh, on the push side, on more collaborative uh, uh, R&D, but also on the pull side and see whether, for instance, they can agree on uh, technology agreements on energy efficiency standards or so. A big issue is always the role of the private sector, uh, and everybody always says, well, yeah, the private sector is really important, but they don't really go beyond that. You know, the private sector is really important, let's engage them. So then the WB CSD comes to the table and they discuss. So, um, maybe for a discussion later, um, I'm really curious to hear what you think about this mechanism. Uh, the UNFC doesn't have a reputation for very effective uh, mechanism, but it has some potential. Um, and what do you think, how, how might it work for energy and development issues and how can you, maybe this network as well, help the, the CTC in particular um, get more effective?